Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. I'm going to give you all a second to connect to sound. Hi, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 874th New Social Environment. Wow. I'm Chloe Dagaman, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the distinct pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Renee Cox and Eleanor Hartney. We're thrilled to welcome poet Dior J. Stevens here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but they do serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now I'll introduce today's guest and host. Renee Cox makes photographs, collages, and installations that draw on art history, fashion photography, and popular culture. Cox's work invokes a critical vision of female sexuality, beauty, power, and heroism through using nudity, religious imagery, and symbolism, her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions internationally, and she's received numerous awards, including the Artist Fellowship Award. Cox is an associate professor at Columbia University. A New York-based art critic, Eleanor Hartney, is an editor-at-large for us at the Brooklyn Rail and a contributing editor for Art in America. She's written extensively for publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others. She's the author of several noteworthy books about art, among them Postmodern Heretics, The Catholic Imagination in Contemporary Art, and Doomsday Dreams, The Apocalyptic Imagination in Contemporary Art. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Eleanor Harney. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Chloe, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Okay, um, so today, this is it's it's wonderful, actually, to be able to do this conversation because, as Chloe mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of my books is is about uh, is is postmodern heretics, uh, and um, it's about Catholicism and contemporary art. And one of the artists featured is Renee Cox. So um, this is a great opportunity to sort of catch up with her again and to talk about not only kind of the those kinds of issues that I dealt with in that book, but just the wider um, kind of range of her work, which is as we will see quite. Amazing. Um, this one one of the reasons that we're doing this um, today is that Renee has a really wonderful show right now at Guild Hall, um, and so any of you who are out in the Hamptons, I encourage you to see it. And even if you can't, I think that today you'll get a good uh, vision of what that show is about. So, um, without further ado, let's go to some images. All right, I this this is actually not in the Guild Hall show, but um, I wanted to include it because it's from it's from a, a, a series um, of Renee's work that I I really love, uh, Raje, which is um, a, a series of works about um, in which she portrays Wonder Woman's um, Amazon sister, and Renee, I'd I'd love you to talk a little bit about this you know, this series, because to me, it, it encapsulates a lot of the things that, you know, are, have been running throughout your work this entire time. I mean, there's the whole issue, of course, of, of kind of empowerment, Black empowerment, female empowerment, um, flipping the script, as you have said, in, in which, you know, we, um, we, we think about, you know, all of these, you know, Wonder Woman, you know, various, you know, kind of power figures, but what happens when you sort of flip it around? And here we have, you know, the this sort of new character, the the Raje. Um, and Raje has in this series, um, she sort of comes in and liberates so many, you know, kind of people who need liberating, um, and Jemima, uh, Uncle Ben, etc. Um, so Renee, let's just start, you know, maybe you might say a little bit about where this series came from, how, you know, what inspired you to create this series? Right. Well, um, okay. So my whole deal with art and, uh, since I started is really about overturning stereotypes that are projected onto black folks. 
uh, also about empowerment, as you said, and also another little talked about thing called the self-love too, that I think needs to be regained within the community. Um, Roger came out of uh, a necessity that I felt uh, was missing within our culture, that um, I was at Toys R Us and I had, my children were young at that time and they wanted Power Rangers. So I was there fighting with people to get these Power Rangers and whatnot. And during the interim, I was walking around the store and I noticed, wow, there's no black superheroes at all. Like there's Storm, but Storm is kind of ethereal, right? She could be anything. And I remember because I used to do commercial photography, um, I had shot a character named Sun Man that they were trying to develop for Essence Magazine uh, as a superhero. He's going to be like a Superman kind of version of it. And nothing ever happened with it. It was like, I don't know, it just went dead in the water, never heard anything more about it. He certainly wasn't at Toys R Us. And then I said to myself, okay, I need to do something about this. So I have this other reactionary kind of way about me. And I took that sort of deep dive, jumped into the whole Wonder Woman thing, started doing research and found out that Charles Martin, the guy who created Wonder Woman, had also during the 1960s for that brief moment when Black was beautiful and it was on the side of buses for ultra sheen commercials, he had created a character named Nubia. And then I took artistic license to say, aha, my character could be like, say, the granddaughter or whatever of Nubia. And her original name was Rage. But then I had to sort of edit myself because I said, if I name her Rage, they're just going to think it's an angry Black woman and they're not going to want to pay attention. So then I came up with Rajay, which had more of a sort of a romantic, exotic kind of way about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I could see it selling perfumes and all kinds of merchandising in a perfect world. So Rajay comes out of that basically. And then the idea was to uh, put her into these situations, as you mentioned, the liberation of Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben from their boxes, which I'm certainly not the only artist that has dealt with that. Betty saw totally inspired me with her version of it. And I did my own and um, Chilling with Liberty is about us sitting there just talking on Robin's Island about when she was brought over from France and how women, any woman couldn't even vote at that time in the United States. And also the fact that the original version of her was based on a black woman. So it's just all this sort of like uh, community camaraderie, um, you know, exchange. Yeah. Well, you know, now with sort of the Marvel universe, you know, sort of taking over in terms of the film world, I think it's time for a film about Rajay, but we'll have to see what we can do. About I agree that. with you, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to, uh, if we can get the next image here. Um, so Rajay is not in this exhibition, although I think her spirit hovers over it. And I wanted to just first, we'll just show um, kind of four installation images from the current show. Yeah, here you can see. And then we're going to zero in on the works individually, because I think it's, you know, there, there's some fascinating stories be behind all of these works, um, as there is behind Rajay. Mm -hmm. so. All right. And so we will, and you'll, okay, good. Let's, let's pause here for a moment. Um, all right. I think it, this, is this the earliest image in the show or earliest work in the show? Yeah, this show is ranging from, I look at this show as part one and there probably could be 20 parts because I've been working for 30 years and this is just like tidbits of bodies, not even all the bodies of work, some of the bodies of work. And it was very interesting to put it all together because it was like it had to flow. And, you know, sort of how do you do that? Because you don't want to just like go blah with all of your work over 30 years and have it, you know, like covering every wall. So this work here is part of a diptych. And this is called Do or Die. And this is one of the first works I did when I was in grad school at the SVA, School of Visual Arts here in New York. 
And I went up to the South Bronx to a location that I was familiar with because I had shot Gang Stars uh, step into the arena album cover in the same area. And what I was interested in doing was breaking the chains of slavery, but I was also showing, you know, but we're still in the same system and blah, blah, blah. If you go to the other slide so that people get the perspective of the- Yeah, I think we rearranged that, but that's down. Yes, we can find that there. Yes. There you go. Okay, so those two go together. And um, so this is the time I go up to the Bronx. I go with six of my- classmates actually and it was a very pivotal moment which I'll get to so in this location you have a lot of homeless people they were burning wire to get the plastic off so that they could retrieve the copper from the inside right so that was the first thing that I sort of had to contend with there were firemen there so I say to the firemen at one point I'm losing my light do you mind? I'm going to be nude and I'm going to be shooting and I don't want you to arrest me. And they were like, well, we don't arrest people, but we'd love to take a picture with you while you're standing <laughs> here nude. So we did that. <laughs> then after that, there's about 20 people watching me and my mates have told the people why I'm doing this and, you know, the sort of political reason behind it. And then what happens is there's that moment where the Jeep passes by and there's like five guys in there. The boots are going bomb, 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 bomb. They see me standing in this field naked. I am wearing Converse's, just so you know, I could run. Um, and they see me naked and they like screeched on the brakes and they like back up at 60 miles per hour. And then they jump out of the, the Jeep and run across the field and actually, you know, talk to the people, right? But it was that moment, like, where I felt like that white woman in the elevator, you know, like, oh, God, clutch your pearls. What's going to happen? You know, <laughs> it was just, and it was, it's just so embedded in one's psyche, you know, this whole racism and, like, stereotypes and thinking about people in certain kinds of ways. Well, I'm here to say to you, that that was not the situation. These same guys that you might have been clutching your pearls if you got into an elevator with them were so respectful, so understanding of what I was doing and why I was doing it. And they stepped to me at the end and they were like, yo, sis, like respect, like we know what you're doing and what you're saying and it's really good and you should continue doing that and you're very brave and you're very courageous. So for me in that moment, is when I realized the strength in being nude because mm. when you're nude people don't mess with you. But when you step to them nude, it's like in a level like playing ground. And it's like, and you know, if you're acting sane, I guess you could say it's, it's a place of like where you get a lot of um, respect. Period. Right. And well, I, I think, yeah, I think that's really for me too. I think that's really, it's so interesting because one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the whole issue of nudity, because of course, um, let's, can we go back, let's go back up to do or die. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's such an integral part. Yeah, here's, yeah, here's an, an, another work, this done at the same time, or I guess just after do or die, right? Right. Um, is, but it's yeah. such an integral part of a lot of your work is, is the, the, the naked body. And of course, that has many, you know, right now, and I think maybe at the time as well, sort of, there's a lot of political connotations to that. I mean, we're, we're back in a time here, we have, you know, your version of, of uh, Michelangelo's David, and the actual Michelangelo's David is again being censored for school children, you know, so there's this kind of moral panic, you know, that periodically seems to surround kind of the, the, the naked body. And even within the art world, you know, there's been, um, I guess, maybe sort of an equivalent kind of moral panic at times about women, you know, showing their bodies naked. I mean, there, there are certain women artists like um, Carolee Schneeman or Hannah Wilkie who did that, you know, and, and was very much a part of their feminism. And then you had sort of this other group that felt that that was somehow, you know, playing into objectification and all that. So there's a lot of kind of potent, I think, significance to using the naked body. And maybe you could, again, you know, like with, with the David here, kind of what what you were, think, what you were getting at here? Well, I think, I mean, let me say this. Americans, they need to grow up, okay? 
uh, this whole over-sexualization of the body, I mean, I think is, especially when it's not being sexual, is kind of ridiculous. You know, it's just a body. It's, you know, this I'm riffing off of Michelangelo's David, right? So what the important thing for me in like say this image is the fact that I've taken away the weapons, which were the rocks and whatnot that he would have had. And I've replaced it with Chet Diop's book, The African Origin of Civilization, which main thesis is to say that it's Black Africans who built Egypt and Sudan with all the pyramids and created that civilization. So that's really what I'm addressing. The okay. fact that one is nude, well, David, like I said, Michelangelo did it first. And then with me here, Again, it's a similar thing. It's like having worked in the fashion industry as a fashion photographer for 10 years as well. I mean, I didn't want to use clothing in this particular image because I didn't want to have any placement of class, of um, time, of any of those things that fashion gives you, right? Mm -hmm. So to present myself nude is for me the purest thing that I can do. Mm -hmm. And me holding my child like that back in the day, some of the feminists said, oh, I was holding my kid like an Uzi. But I'm like, no, 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 girls. I'm not holding my kids like an Uzi. I'm holding my kid like somebody, a mother, who has, wants to move from point A to point B very quickly. That's mm -hmm. how you keep your kid. The reason I had this stilettos on is, okay, I will take a note from fashion, but I will have to say to you, Sensible shoes are very nice. However, if you want the body, the female body to like have a nice line, it is nice to have a little bit of height on it. And that's as simple as that, because I mean, there is an aesthetic. And I like to think that I can create images that are at least visually seductive, that draw people in. And then there's the whole backstory with it. And right. what I was gonna say, the backstory with that just briefly was, the fact I was at the Whitney Independent Study Program at that point, and I was pregnant with my second child. And I was shocked because when I came in to, you know, our seminars, I said, hi, I'm pregnant, basically. And people said to me, oh, my God, are you sure? Like, what are you going to do? And I, like, I didn't even know what they were talking about because the first baby, I was in the fashion industry. And that was just sort of like, don't break your water on our shoot. He, he, he. Right. <laughs> So now here I am in the intellectual world of art and people are acting like they came out of some sort of immaculate conception. And that's when I had to understand that there was this huge double standard between female and male artists. And if they had children, how that was perceived for the male artist, it's great. Now his prices can go up because now he doesn't have to run around chasing tail. You know, and but for the female artist, if she has children, it means it's now she's become brain dead and she only sees baby blue and pink and can't do anything else. And I was like, OK, another one of my reactions. I go, no, that's not it. You're not going to stop me. Just as I got my master's degree and I'm at the Whitney program, I'm at the beginning of my career. So we're going to go in full force with this. And right. I feel like motherhood. That's a great thing. If you choose to do it, it's great. And I feel like we're goddesses and we should be put on pedestals because we are the givers of life. That's yeah. it. Well, you did, and you did a whole series and Yo Mama, I mean, and we, I think we have some more here as well, different sort of versions here, um, a kind of very different take. They they have these, some of them, this connotation of, you know, you think of mother and child, but then this one's very sort of Africanized. Do you want to talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, absolutely. This is your mama, Donna, and child. When I was uh, undergrad at Syracuse University, I did a semester abroad, in, semester abroad in Florence, and I was presented with all of this high art that was done by Europeans. And obviously, mother, Madonna, and child is like a big part of that. And I decided with my philosophy of flipping the script to inject myself into that scenario. So I had known of this artist down in Washington, D.C. named Janua Moja, who did the costume, actually. 
And the costume is interesting in the sense that it's all of the African fabrics that you would find on the continent, but they're all printed in China. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then the reference with the headdress is a Yoruba headdress. And um, I just decided to do my revisionist thing of like putting myself in there and um, creating this image. What's funny is that the American Embassy in Jamaica, dude, this was a program through the State Department, um, wanted to show this there, right? And two weeks in, um, someone calls me from the State Department and they go, there's an issue with the photograph. And I was like, an issue? Like what possible issue could there be? And they said to me, somebody, I don't know who this pedophile was, um, felt that the penis was too obvious. And I was like, wait a minute, like, excuse me, like, have you been to the Met? Have you seen all the Madonna and Childs? Right. It's a male child, he has a penis. What do you, I mean, this is a baby, right. penis. What, what's wrong with you? Right. And actually asked me, and this is like the beginning of Photoshop, right? It barely existed, you didn't even have layers then. And they asked me like, can you lift the fabric and just cover that? And I was just like, you know what? No, screw you. You know, <laughs> I'm not even getting paid for this. I don't care. I'm not doing that. You know, and you need to check the person that noticed it and is making a big stink right. about it because they have an issue. Well, you know, there. The, I mean, and Leo Steinberg actually did a whole book about, you know, the sexuality of Christ, which is just, I mean, hundreds of photographs of, of reproductions of paintings of renaissance paintings in which the virgin mary is you know pointing to the penis displaying the penis of of baby jesus because as his argument was it had had to do with a kind of larger theological debate about the humanity of christ and proving that christ was human you had to show that penis so Ooh. yeah there's a huge history of the penis of christ in fact yeah. <laughs> so. well i hope um, they <laughs> I know, but and, and I mean, one of the things, you know, as I as I mentioned, that I've always um, it has been very interesting to me about your work is the way that you kind of, again, flipping the script with these kinds of traditional um, religious images. And here again, we have the Pieta. Um, so now we have the, the 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 adult Christ and a much more kind of mournful image in a way. But again, this sort of image about, you know, it's, it's about motherhood and and. And this, you know, that the incredible bond between the mother and the son. And at the same time, it's also a kind of very elegiac and one can read into it, you know, the sort of this, this dead black man's body, you know, certainly in, in current, you know, days, we're thinking about Black Lives Matter and all of that. So it, it has these larger political implications as well. Um, and again, I mean, I'd be curious to hear the story behind this one. Well, I think you hit it right on the head. That's exactly what it is. I mean, it's like I went to Catholic school the first four years of school. And, um, you know, I think it has an impact on one because it's the only religion that went out and asked artists to create all this imagery for them. You know, Judaism doesn't have it. Islam doesn't have it. But the Catholics, they sure got a lot of images. So that was also something for me to tap into. Uh, in terms of taking this revisionist look at things. But this shot, I mean, the sad part about this shot, as you mentioned, is that it's still so relevant today. Mm -hmm. And in the show, um, which you don't really get that feeling, but I'm going to tell you, it's this photograph is only four inches by four inches. In fact, even on your laptop now, it's bigger than what it is in reality for me. Because I love to use scale, but there are certain I love to do like huge, you know, 10 foot, 12 foot photographs, but but with this one, I wanted it to be four inches by four inches, you know, surrounded by black velvet and an enormous mahogany frame so that you have to get close. You had to zero in on what was happening here. So mm -hmm. as reference to, you know, the religious aspects of it, but unfortunately to today's yeah. uh you know, things that are happening every week. I mean, I don't care where I am. I hear about some black young man that's been shot down by the authorities or the police or somebody. And it's just a crime. It's been going on for 400 years and it's completely absurd. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, this work, you know, I mean, it has these kind of art historical and often as we'll see historical um, kind of connotations, but it's also incredibly current. Mm -hmm. um, 
next next one, please. Okay, now this one also is not in the exhibition, but um, I wanted to include it because, you know, th this one, um, well, this was this was a big controversy and one that you know I followed quite closely. Um, this is a, again flipping the script here, flipping the script of of um, obviously of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Um, but here, all the participants except for Judas are black. And of course, Christ has been replaced by this, you know, kind of very, um, you know, beatific version of you. Right. Um, this, as you know, um, pe some people may remember that this this created a big stink because uh, Rudy Giuliani, who was then, he was he was still a somewhat more respectable figure than he is today, was the mayor of New York and. Mm -hmm. Uh, he th this work appeared in an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, and he was sort of courting the Catholic vote and threatened to shut the museum to, to um, get rid of all the state, the, the, the city funding for the museum because it was such a, he thought, sacrilegious and blasphemous image, which, of course, you know, looking at it now, it clearly is not. But, mm -hmm. but instead, it's, you know... I, I think it, it's kind of asking us to, it's about inclusion, really, you know, that that um, asking us to think about religion and these stories that we have all been told, but thinking about them in a more inclusive way, who's been left out, you know, right. here. And, you know, so by making the Jesus figure into a black woman, you know, I think in particular, it makes us think about that. Again, right. I don't know if you want to, I mean, that this was played out a lot in the press. There was a lot of discussion. I think we have, yeah, we have some close-ups here as well. But it was um, so long ago, I think probably people don't remember it, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of people might not have been, been alive at the time, yeah. too. Uh, no, this was, um, see, the mistake that they made in Catholic school, I think with me personally, was that they said that we were all created in the likeness of God. Okay, so I took that literally as I think I should have, you know, so why not have a black woman God? That's who I am, right? So that was the first part of my, my thinking behind this. Also, there's like a lot of like weirdness in Catholicism, like in fourth grade, I could share the story, you know, I had to do Holy Communion. So it was like, they give you this wafer, that at the time it was like made in Secaucus, New Jersey, and you can't chew it. You know, it has to dissolve in your mouth because it's the body of Christ, mm -hmm. which I was like, wow, that's really bizarre. And then you had the wine where it was like this nasty wine that they would serve in church. And this is his blood. So I'm like, wait a minute, like, wait, you guys have been ragging on the pagans, but like, this is like completely cannibalistic. <laughs> Like when I'm eating his body and I'm drinking his blood, who does that? They do that in Papua New Guinea, I think. <laughs> they actually yeah. sent in a Jesuit to speak to me because <laughs> they were like, this one is like not right. And so with this piece, I had no, um, no reservations about me being playing the Christ figure. And again, I repeat, it's like, I'm just giving you my pure body. There's nothing sexualized about it. And during the debacle of this uh, Your Mama's Last Supper, I had like, uh, what's his name? I think William Donahue from the Catholic mm -hmm. League, all of them jumping on me because it's like, oh, you're naked. And I'm like, excuse me, like what's wrong with being naked? I mean, that's how we come into this world, right? But I said, I really believe the issue that you are having is the fact that you have a black woman who thought that she could sit at the center of that table. And I said, I think that's what's really disturbing you. And you're just using the nudity as this sort of, um, you know, uh, what is it? Kind of like yellow journalism, sensationalism. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly, yeah. And that's not the crux of it because I mean, no disrespect to Maplethorpe or anything, but I mean, I don't have a bullwhip coming out of my anus either. <laughs> exactly. You know what I'm <laughs> so right. it's just like, I'm here and that's it, right. yeah. yeah. Well, and this is, yeah, the, the sort of a powerful black woman, you know, also, I think, what, what do we, what's the next image that we have here? Um, oh, actually, no, this is of, of your son. This is, and this is interesting. This, this is the same child that was in the, uh, um, the other work where, where you're holding the child? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so now growing up and, you know, again, a sort of very proud image and, um, you know, all, all of these images have a little, you know, I don't know. There's a. I feel a little bit of a religious aura that's sort of almost, you know, the kind of light 
that we would see in old master paintings. I mean, it's 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 a very Absolutely. beautiful I image. Love Rembrandt lighting. You got yeah. love, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. it's like lighting, photography, you know, they go hand in hand. I tell students that all the time. It's like no light, no photography or bad photography. And I would, one thing I, I like about my images personally is that I think they're really timeless. Like mm -hmm. you don't look at them and go, oh, wow, that was from the eighties. I like that was from this period. You know, I think they kind of endure. And this one, my son, um, this is me basically reworking the American flag. So I did my version of it. So I left one white star and I left one white stripe just to mm. show there were some white people there, but we know who is really working that flag upstairs in that atelier. You know, it's probably some black woman, you know, when Betsy mm. Ross is running around, look what I did, look what I did, you know, and there's like some woman up there like, you know, so <laughs> together. Right. Exactly. So that yeah. is my take on that. Yeah. And that's what this photograph is. Yeah, but it's very elegant. <laughs> exactly. yeah. And here, you know, you did a number of works like this that were sort of flipping the, the again, flipping the script on, um, you know, very famous paintings here, obviously Manet's Dejeuner sur l'herbe, which has a completely different sort of sense of, of kind of power relationships here. In the original painting, of course, you know, you have these two clothed men and, and then these two women, one of them is sort of in the, you know, in the background, but this one in the foreground staring at you who's, who's naked and they're, you know, clearly is meant to be a kind of object of, you know, delectation. And here, you know, she's as clearly the power figure. Um, right. So very interesting the way you flip that strip script. And she's being protected. These two guys actually were my trainers back in the day. So it's actually a protection thing. The interesting thing here is that it's called Cousins at Pussy's Pond, which is actually out in the Hamptons. It is in the Springs. It's uh, like part of Amagansett across from the general store. So this is where it's been shot. So that was like a really uh, nice touch to it as well. But right. this is about being glorified and it's about being protected. And that's what it is. Right. Yeah. So, and because, oh, I know, I forgot. No, Manet, I did the research, right? So Manet actually took his composition from a third century Roman sarcophagus called the River Gods. Mm. When I found that out, that's when I went like, bingo, wow. you know, let's do it here in Springs where you have this pond and whatnot and the whole bit. So wow. yeah, that's how that came about. Yeah, that's a great image. Yeah. And now we there we have, a, I think, several images from a series that you did about Queen Nanny. Um, yeah. And you want to tell, tell us about that? All right. So Queen Nanny is the only female national hero in Jamaica who led guerrilla warfare against the British uh, in the 1700s and won. And the people still live on the lands today. They don't look any different from any other Jamaicans. It's not like Amish or something like that. Uh, and it's basically their own little sovereign state within the island of Jamaica. They don't pay taxes to Jamaica. They are uh, ruled, if you want to say that, by a colonel, which that is a little weird to me. I haven't really found out why it's called, why he's called the colonel, but that's what it is. And the Maroons, for those of you who don't know, were the escaped slaves of the Spaniards initially in Jamaica. Those were the first colonizers. And they went up into inhospitable geographical areas like rainforest, mountains, limestone areas that were very hard for others to reach and they set up their own communities and they're like a proud people i really love those people when i go to jamaica i go see them first before i go see my relatives mm -hmm. and this kind of project is it takes you like about it took me about two years to do you know completely there's over 25 images in it because you have to build up trust and you have to build relationships, right. you know, yeah. and you have to okay, get yeah. people to lend you their children too. <laughs> so wow. that takes time. And so, so this is from that series as well, right? Yes, yeah. it is. This one is called The Mother of Us All. And how I wanted to represent uh, Queen Nanny was I wanted to show her what she would have been like historically and also what she would have been currently in present time. 
Also with the red coat, I should mention the reason she's wearing the red coat is because when you defeat somebody and then you wear their uniform, this is like the biggest insult ever. And she's with her weapon of choice, which is the machete. Mm. Right. And we have, I think, one more from this series. Right. This is River Queen. So this echoes the, the thing of what she would have been in the past. And this is one of the tributaries of the River, River Grand, no, Rio Grande in uh, Portland, which is a parish in Jamaica on the, east co on the east side of the island. Right. And here we have, yeah, back, well, we, let's go back one. So, and then just, cause we're doing this chronologically, but we, but it was very good to pair this one with that, um, the earlier do or die image. But again, um, you know, these very powerful, very powerful female figures, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're all, they're strong. They're, you know, they're not victims. You know, they, they may have been through terrible histories, but, you know, they, you know, they show strength, which is, I think, one of the messages that all your work pretty much conveys. Exactly. I'm not interested in portraying Black people as victims or, you know, in squalor or, you know, looking dejected or any of that stuff. I mean, just my own personal belief. I believe we're a powerful people and I love my people and I'm going to show them in the best light that I possibly can, right. which may not be, you know, as commercially viable, but okay. that's just who I am and that's what I'm going to continue yeah. to do. Yeah. So, well, and it has, and it does have uh, political implications as this, this um, mm -hmm. is another one of these, this is a real epic uh, monumental piece here, um, the signing, which is, you know, it, I think again, incredibly relevant at the moment when, you know, we have people trying to basically rewrite American history. You know, you've got this backlash against the 1619 um, project, you know, which, which tried to talk about how, you know, really slavery, well, it kind of goes back to the beginning of America, you know, way before actually um, mm. America was America. Right. And um, so here, what you, you've done here is, again, you're flipping the script. This is a painting about what the signing, uh, I mean, it's based on a painting about the signing of the Constitution, right? Right. Um, right. And again, has been reworked. Um, and we can see some details here. I think we have some details. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, has been reworked, and again, you know, in a way to be inclusive, because of course the Constitution, you know, many scholars feel the Constitution is part of where you know the origin of of kind of the problem, because in the Constitution, it it acknowledged or it it, it declared. Um, you know what that that slaves were three quarters of a human i think it was right. um you know so so even though we had the declaration of independence which said all men were created equal with the constitution embedded in it was this other kind of very kind of n evil nasty thing which you know i think has right is continuing to play its way out, you know, and part of the, the problem in American society today is we've never sort of resolved this contradiction. Right. Um, and that was the beginning of white supremacy as well. Yeah. 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 The whole beginning of race, you know, race doesn't really have any scientific value. You know, that was basically created out of enforcing and maintaining white supremacy. Because before mm -hmm. that, if you went to Europe, people would describe themselves, well, I'm Gaul because I'm from France or I'm Portuguese or I'm Spanish or whatever. They weren't go running around saying, hi, I'm white. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is like a new thing as well. This again, another reaction of mine because Trump was in power and I was like, oh God, this is crazy. So I said like, I had to go back and do something that I felt, you know, could um, at least create some sort of discourse uh, behind that. And that's why I chose to do this. And, yeah. um, you know, it is epic. And I had the location, the location was uh, the Andrew Friedman home up in the Bronx, uh, which is actually owned by this black woman who is sitting right there with the uh, white uh, shawl on. Ah. Uh, and it's an interesting story because this building was it built, it's like it takes up an entire city block, like on the Grand Concourse, and the guy, Andrew Friedman, built it for his friends who lost all their money during the Great Depression, and he didn't want them to feel poor, so he built this mansion with three giant, like, ballrooms. This is the library in that building, 
And every and then they would have like a small apartment and every night they could get dressed up and kind of reenact how they lived, I guess, during the Gilded mm -hmm. Age and so on and so forth. And then the building fell into disrepair. The city wanted to take it down. And then this woman saved it and has been able to keep it going through various government programs and city programs, you know, to keep it afloat. So that's wow. the story behind that, too. Wow. 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 It's, it's an amazing image. Yeah, it's just, it's really again, the same strategy of using some historical outfits, but also using contemporary outfits so that it's not just rooted in the history. It's now also rooted in uh, contemporary times as well. You're right. Yeah. So. All right. Next, let's, let's see, what do we have here? What we have next? Ah, so now, um, we turn to um, this. This is a, a, a kind of a, a well, several bodies of work, I guess, but that bringing us up to your present work, which is, is very different in certain ways. Um, you know, it's I mean, I find it interesting that I mean, there's a kind of, again, religious feeling or spiritual, I should say, feeling, but very far removed from, say, the kind of Catholic imagery that you were using before. You know, this feels much more Eastern. It, it's also it's, it's sort of non-hierarchical in the way that Catholicism is hierarchical. Um, and it 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 feels like it goes back to, um, you know, kind of. I guess God. Well, a, a different, a different view, I guess, of, of 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 nature, of humanity, and of our relationship to kind of the spirit world. Did you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, this is a big shift for me. Um, the way I sort of describe this is to say, this is when I discovered how to be happy. And how did I do that? Okay, well, the story goes like this. I was in Bali, I was traveling alone. I was staying in a beautiful hotel. Um, I was the first guest to ever be in this little villa at. I even had a butler, but hmm. guess what? I'm in this room feeling sorry for the little me. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't have a retrospective. I don't have a book, I don't have this. I don't have that, you know, I'm being written out of the canon, like just crazy, crazy, like artists, like depression kind of situation. And if I had a gun, probably in that moment, I probably would have shot myself because it was just like one of those, one of those days. Uh, but a friend of mine had suggested to me some months earlier to get an audio book called um, Living the Liberated Life and Dealing with the Pain Body by Eckhart Tolle. So previously, I couldn't listen to Eckhart because he speaks very slowly, very deliberately. And when you're completely unconscious, you're like, okay, hurry up, what are you talking about? Oh, get to the point. Da, 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 da. And now I found myself in a state of mind where I was just completely open and vulnerable. And I was sick and tired of suffering that his voice calmed me down. And it just equal, equaled me out, you know what I'm saying? And then he says one thing that really changed my life. He said, why are you waiting for the world to validate you? And I was like, oh my God, that was like the aha moment. I was like, Jesus, I'm an only child. I've always waited for that. Uh, you know, somebody tell me, you know, I'm like smart and I'm talented, you know, I'm cute, whatever. And if I didn't get it, I would like getting people's faces. I'd be like, no, you don't see me. I'm here. What's wrong with you? Actually, if somebody does do that, you got to know that that's the first sign of madness. <laughs> so, you know, try to stop them. <laughs> anyway, so, but with Eckhart, he goes a step further. He explains how to get out of your head. And he goes, okay, when you have a negative thought come in, you have to be the witness to each and every negative thought that comes in. So basically, to say in short form, what I started doing as soon as I had found out that information, because I had like another five, six days left in Bali by myself, I started every negative thought that came into my head, I'd be like, okay, I see you, that's my ego, that's my egoic mind working, get the fuck out of my head, get, the, get out, get out, get out, get out. Okay, after you do that for two days nonstop, <laughs> you get to a point where what the Buddhists say, you have a place of uh, no thought, right? Those negative thoughts subside. They will never go away, but they subside. And doing this technique, 
you learn how to control it when they do manifest again. You know, it's not like you identify with it. I think most people in our society, they identify with all those that negative thinking. And that's why they're on antidepressants and antipsychotics and all this other stuff, which is completely unnecessary. And then I returned to the States. And when I returned to the States, I'm working with my assistant. I've always shot portraiture on black velvet backgrounds. Um, and I've used the black velvet to cover people's bodies, part of their bodies, and just only have the exposed parts, you know, that I wanted to see out. And then we started cutting around those images. And then I started getting interested in fractals and sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. And then those images became like palette to build on. You know, so I wanted to create what I would call portraits of these people. And um, it just went from there. And then what you're looking at here is the evolution beyond the flat image to where I'm actually hand cutting out the images. And for me as a photographer, it's a moment like where I feel like a painter, like I've got a palette and then I can build on um, that. And so wow. this image is actually a three-dimensional image. The, you know, it's coming off of the surface and it's a unique piece. I can't do the same thing twice. Mm. And yeah. the thing with these is, is that it really puts you in touch with your like inner child. It's, uh, it's fun, which is, you know, it's not, that's not like a big word in the art world, but <laughs> I don't care. It's fun and it brings a lot of joy. And there is no algorithm. People have asked me that. I have no idea what it's going to be, you know, necessarily in the beginning, except for the flat one that I did previously. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I love it. And I think it's really good because it's like, you can't, you can't just look at it once. Every time you look at it, you're going to see something different. And mm -hmm. I think it gets people out of their head, especially in this time that we're like people are like swipe left swipe left nah you ain't gonna swipe left to this right it's you it's too. very i mean these works are i mean yeah they i mean they're about a kind of unity i guess mm -hmm. you know i mean and they're about a, a a you know a comprehensiveness um instead of being kind of it, it's not about sort of the individual so much about american society now is about you know the individual but but these you know they i don't know it's like this multiplicity, I guess, um, they, they express this kind of sense of, of multiplicity in this very, um, yeah, it, it's true, it's sort of mesmerizing way. I mean, they're kaleidoscopic and they're, they're um, I mean, in yeah, Jamaica, they, the national motto is out of many, we are one, something like mm, that. Yeah, and exactly. That, that yeah. was like an underlying thing that, you know, would be going through my mind, you know, as I was doing these as well. And yeah. You mentioned in the beginning, which I'll reinforce, I mean, yes, I was also looking at uh, Buddhist art, Hindu art, uh, psychedelic art, all of that stuff, you know, right. played in, as well as fractals and sacred geometry. And it right. is about the multiplicity of, you know, of human beings. We're human beings, right. period, in the story. And yeah. we're made up of all of these because it's not just her that's in there there's other figures there's male figures you know there's even a caucasian figure in there you know what i'm saying but i'm not i'm not about labeling stuff i mean i feel now that we're going into the fifth dimension we're supposed to be getting away from labels <laughs> and now people have dropped like a ton of more labels on top yeah. of everything and i'm like I don't know, people, this is not the right direction. We're supposed to just be able to look at something and derive some joy from it without mm -hmm. having to break it down into this and that, because that takes away from its essence, from its life. So right. yeah, yeah. And you and from this, then you you let's see, what's what's the next image we have here? Um yeah, so now leading us to the the kind of um real the piece de resistance of of the uh, show at guild hall is this installation soul culture and um just you know this this is a completely immersive um installation we have a couple of still images here and then we're going to show a little clip that will give you a sense of kind of just how it moves but it, it, there's so much in the in the 
works that we you just showed us there's a sense of motion but here there's actual motion um mm -hmm. and i don't should we let's should we show the clip first and then you could talk about it yeah or i can yeah you can show the clip and then i can talk about it or or yeah. well, you know why don't you talk about it while the clip gets it's put on okay so what i'm trying to do here is uh well not trying i did it um, I had a residency down in um, Pittsburgh, actually, um, through um, a funder, Sybil Shrine, which was this residency that uh, I went to down there in Pittsburgh. And they hooked me up with graduate students from Carnegie Mellon University who were doing like computer science and whatnot. And I sat down with them and we came up with this, you know, I mean, not idea of projection mapping because that exists, but taking my imagery and creating a space that would be immersive uh, that one could actually feel like they were in. And the reason that came about for me too is it kind of goes back to my childhood of a film that I was really into called um, The Fantastic Voyage with uh, Raquel Welch, I think. And it was I remember about, that film, yeah. <laughs> they had to be miniaturized so that they could go inside of this scientist to like relieve an aneurysm that was in his brain that was inoperable. So they had to travel through the human body. So that was also one of the things that was going through my mind. I wanted to sort of try to create that feeling. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we get the clip here. Yeah. So. And I think this kind of evokes that kind of feeling. And one of the things, like having shown at Guild Hall, that's been great, is that like a larger audience is about to see it. And it, it appeals to little kids as well as, you know, old people or whatever. You know, I think people are pretty mesmerized. And when at the other day they had a family day there, like a little kid running over here. That was very rewarding on some level. Sort of like, wow, this is multi generational. And, you know, I know I'm not there saying this, and they get it. They get it. In, in the, right. But they have soul, they get it. Yeah. Wow. And the way that, like, I told you, it's all the time. Like, you got to do it from here, from the heart, from the soul. I go, like, you just use the brain as a tool. That's it. Yeah. You know? Don't live in the brain because so much of the work that I think we see today is created in the brain and it's pretty freaking ugly, but you know, hey, what can I say? Yeah. I think the brain is like, like I said, it's a tool. You go there for the execution, you go there for the marketing, you go there for, you know, all that other stuff. But in terms of creation and idea, I think it really comes from the soul, the gut, whatever you want to call it. And right. Don't stand in your way, because I find a lot of like in terms of students, they're always second guessing themselves. And to yeah. do this kind of work, you can't second guess yourself. If you second guess yourself, I wouldn't do anything. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's a it's an amazing thing. And I think it's interesting the way it, it you know, I mean, it it's very it's a it's a real break from the earlier work. But there's also, you know, I think a, a strong connection. And and at, I think at the end of the installation, there's you there's a voiceover and you talk about um, the goddess, which right. I found very interesting. It's I've been doing some research about kind of the whole goddess you know, um, movement in the 70s, which was totally discredited, and which now is once again, kind of coming forward. And we're sort of saying, wait a minute, this was actually very interesting, because it, it was sort of condemned for being essentialist, you know, feminist, the feminists didn't like it, it was essentialist feminism, you know, making women, you know, it, it was just um, turning, you know, the hierarchical religion upside down. So you have a woman at the top instead of a man. But in fact, the goddess movement wasn't about that at all. It was really about an interconnectivity, which is, I think, what you're expressing very much um, in this installation and the idea of the goddess, not as, you know, there, as one of the scholars at the time said, we're not trying to find Yahweh in a skirt. You know, we're doing, you know, the goddess is, is about a kind of um it, it's about nature, a, a, a vision, a unity of nature, basically, that we are all a part of. And 
anyway, so I think that that to me that installation sort of really beautifully expresses that, and it and it does kind of relate back to these ideas that were current in the 70s and then kind of got pushed aside, you know, when we all got into deconstruction or whatever. But, right, right, and then yeah, postmodernism and all this right. other stuff that it's like. You know, that's very nice, but uh, I think it's time to bring it back to the essence of, you know, like just humankind and, you know, how do we all get along and how do we realize that we're all just one at the end of the day and that all this other stuff has been divisive and it's been about, you know, divide and conquer and separate and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's sort of like how much longer do we play into this crap? Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It, well, I think I think that's anything. yeah, that's probably a great place to to pause now and um turn it over for questions. I think we're right on schedule yeah, here. We're right on time. This is like <laughs> so, um anyway, yeah. So let's let's um I think Chloe, let's turn it over to Chloe and see what we've got. Yeah, there is a question in the chat right now, Renee, uh, asking what you teach at Columbia. Oh, well, let me be clear. I had a one year appointment at Columbia. I'm no longer at Columbia, but where I am is I'm a critic in the MFA photo program at Yale. So, uh, and it's photography and photography and life lessons, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ask a question and I encourage folks to either raise your hand or ask a question in the chat. Um, my question, Renee, is, uh, when did you know that photography was your medium? Um, and then from that point, kind of how did you seek out photography on your own and what what led you to photography? I'm really curious to hear you speak about that. All right. Uh, the first thing that I was interested in actually was film. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to Syracuse as an undergrad, I went there to study film with um, Owen Shapiro, who was all about the independent filmmaker at that time. And while I was in that program, this is way back, people. So we're talking about A and B rolling. We're talking about cutting the clips and putting a masking tape on them and then putting them in the bin. And then you had to like physically splice it. And it was very laborious. And uh, being a baby boomer, I guess you could say, I found that doing photography was <laughs> more instant gratification. And while I was in school, some of the um, hair salons like that were on campus, like found out about me and whatnot. So I started doing work for them. And then I was like, oh, wow, this is great. I can like shoot this in the morning and I can deliver it in the evening. And whereas with film, I was like sleeping in the editing room on the cutting table and selling my books in order to make films. So that was, I guess, that pivotal moment. And then the thing was, I was always interested in fashion, always loved fashion, loved Avedon, Penn. Deborah Turbeville was very instrumental for me in terms of giving me a, a roadmap, a blueprint as to how to proceed. Uh, and um, so when I graduated, I did fashion photography for about 10 years like in my 20s. And then when I had my first kid, I think maybe a little bit of consciousness had started to get into me. And I was like, oh, I can't talk about a shoot for half an hour. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Whereas before I could. And also Nelson Mandela had just been released from prison. And I was with a group of people at Jerry's in Soho. And I remember saying to them, oh, wow, Nelson Mandela just got released from prison. That's incredible. He was in jail for, I don't know, 29 years, whatever it was. And they all looked at me and they said, oh, um, hmm, uh, Donald and Ivana are getting a divorce. And I was like, what? Like, are you kidding me? But that's what was on the front page of the Post in the Daily News that day. And I was just <laughs> like, OK, you know what? I think I got to pivot. I think I got to leave this world and go into something else that where I'll have some legacy. Cause I was like, what am I going to show my kids? Like my oldest is now 34 and it's actually come to pass. Like if I show him like my old fashioned stuff, he's like, that's nice. Yeah. They were beautiful, but they old now. So who cares? <laughs> wow. so at least with art, I, you know, it gives me some legacy. <laughs> Thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> We have a question from Joe in the audience. Joe, I'm going to give you the chance to unmute to ask directly. Um, here you go. 
Hey, Renee, it's Joe. Um, so hey. you mentioned, hey, uh, so you mentioned you really like being able to step into the art. I'm wondering if virtual reality could be a logical next step for your work. Um, actually, it could be. It could be. I mean, I have, I mean, I've tried it. I like it. Um, I'm just trying to figure out like how it could be more, you know, sort of inclusive, more public, because it just, it's great, but it seems like it's it's just very much about the individual. I think VR is, it could be great for like brainwashing propaganda. It could be great for people to sort of step out of their own little world, but I wonder how it could be done as a group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for me, that's the only missing ingredient now. Like, could you have like, you could have your VR thing on, but you could also be in community, in communion with other users at the same time. I mean, maybe that's happening in the gaming world or something, but I, I want it to be more seamless, I think, at this point. Love that question, Joe. Thank you. Um... Eleanor is going to ask the last question before we transition to our poetry reading today. Eleanor, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you, Chloe. Um, and thank you so much, Renee and Eleanor. It's been such an inspiring and amazing conversation. Um, Renee, I'm curious about how your work in a more commercial setting, such as your history in fashion photography, has um, influenced your like more personal artistic practice or maybe there isn't such a boundary but I'm curious about the relationship between those two practices um it's funny you ask that because it was like in grad school people would be like oh it's too perfect oh the lighting's too good this that it's not you know like artsy enough and then I would be like okay because you don't know how to light and you couldn't light your way out of the paper bag <laughs> That's why you're saying that to me. So what do you think? To make it more artsy, I should put it on the floor, piss on it, take a crop on it, crumble it up, and then unfurl it. And then like, oh, wow, this is art. Um, so it's, it, it's. I think I, I would say it's influenced me on the technical side, because I do believe it's important to know some of the rudiments of a medium. And it's funny because even with my teaching and whatnot, I mean, a lot of institutions, they're like sort of reticent about that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you have to learn how to make silver gelatin film and go to, you know, Rochester Institute of Technology. But at the same time, I think one should have a good handle on the medium that they're working with. Like I tell students all the time, I say like, look at Miles Davis. He played the scales every day. Why? Not because you have to play the scales every day, but that's the crux of all music, isn't it? So you've got to know, you know, the rudiments and the core of, I think, what you're doing. And that I can say I know. Like if somebody asked me to shoot 30 people, like in the signing or even in a commercial job, I can do that. And I can have people come in at 10 o'clock in the morning and I can have them out of there by say 1.30 in the afternoon and they're all in shock. And I said, well, if you work with a professional, that's what you're gonna get. But if you wanna work you know, with one of these, whatever, no offense, these kids that don't know what they're doing, you'll be there until nine o'clock at night. Yes. <laughs> so I think there's something definitely to be said for knowing what it is you're doing. Yeah. So it does inform, you know. And it gives you leeway too, you know, to do other things. You know, a lot of people like they'll be like, "Oh, you know, oh, I got this effect. It was, it was, a, it was just like a surprise or a mistake," and that can be great too. But it would be nice if you knew how you got there, so you could do it again, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And if you knew composition and if you knew lighting, that you didn't have to shoot. Like I hate now. Like I'll give my phone to somebody and I'll say, "Take a picture." And they take freaking 100 pictures of the same damn thing. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, I'm like, okay, let's have a contest. Watch me get the same shot in three frames. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, well, I'm, I'm shooting like that because it's like, well, that way, you know, the odds are in my favor. And I'm like, you know, not necessarily. You know, <laughs> if it's sucked once, it's going to suck again 100 times. And then it's clogging up my phone on top of it. And then I got to delete all this crap. No. <laughs> so... <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you so much. For that. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for that question, Eleanor. And thank you for all of your very generous answers, Renee. 
Uh, <laughs> Thank you as well again for this conversation. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Dior J. Stevens, to the virtual stage. Dior J. Stevens is a proud Pisces hailing from Midwestern waters. He is the author of the chapbooks Screams and Lavender, 001 and Canon. Their debut full length collection, Cruel Cruel, is out now with Nightboat Books. They'll happily serve, they happily serve as the managing poetry editor of Foglifter Journal and Press. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dior. Thanks, Chloe. And thanks to Eleanor and Renee. This was an incredible, incredible dialogue. This is exactly what I'd want to do on a Friday afternoon. So thank you for inviting me. I'm really honor to read after all that incredibleness. Oh, I see a proud Pisces in the chat. Shout out to y'all. Um, I'm going to be reading from my debut full-length collection of poems, Cruel Cruel, out now with the incredible Night Boat books. And I have a couple of poems for y'all. This first one is Untitled Yellow Page Number Three. Asking all masks of capital and colonial be removed before we come to the Lord, my Lord, our Lord, none of it matters, inshallah. Say 52 Hail Marys for your ancestors lost in uncharted, unfriendly waters. Throw your back out in prayer for they see you as your blood, inshallah. Sing hymnals at the feet of mules. Tell them change is the latest alternative milk trend. Soak that shit right up, inshallah, praise be, and benedict your altered gaze, reconstructed eyes and fickle tongues, inshallah, honor your blessings for a fortnight and wash your hair in red clay, inshallah, try to wash all the masks off of you now, still your whitest parts into a bowl, fingernails, teeth, eye white, Combined with chicken wishbone, broken, a hefty serving of onyx fragments, and one Marvin Gaye record, also broken, inshallah. Ask that whiteness to reevaluate and see thy onyx, thou hardiest and solemnest of stones, inshallah. Ask, why be anything less? Sing to Mama Lucy unearthed, say, Inshallah, Grandmother. I long for your essence of Black purity and all that I am. Outside of art, I see thyself unearthed, humming holies into the wind, spilling rhythms of hot cross tongues. Rake your ashes into the streets and make a white man cry at the waterfall of their exception. Coughing up grime disturbia, sun spotting black hoodies as angels of resurrection, cross out every year of expected death. Plant plum trees in your white neighbor's backyard and say, all that hangs here is more than gold. Um, got another one from this section for you. This is untitled yellow page number seven. Thank you to Brooklyn Rail for having me here. Plum honey, plum smooth, plum overabundant, plum spiral, plum meritocracy, plum hay beetle, plum weight of all, plum overturned, reinstated, redefined, plum shiver like honeybees, plum sachet in the golden swat, plum interruption from the sub dimension, plum rutabaga, plum sacrifice on mole hill, Plum belief that one day the signs will be clear as frost. Plum firefish likes nothing raw. Plum fool, plum irony. Plum meat that grinds and redefines. Plum suffrage for an overdue spring. Plum honeysuckle, plum, plum. What waste is implicit in fruition? Plum might, plum direct. Holy plum, holy plum, holy. Pretending at something. Plum split open, purple pus, playing computer, pillowing dry palm, praying sideways, praying more, 
because possibly pirouetting up riptides with a pumpkin-headed prissy boy, pristine and painted neon, pretending and polling and proclivities. And I'm gonna end with the three shorter poems. Um, this is from my favorite section of the book. I call it very belovedly the black vortex or black hole section of the book. Um, shout out to Nightbo for printing these black pages. Um, this first one, it takes us a bit through 2020. This first one is 415 2020, untitled. Directed, stare into screen long enough for frost to mold. Wait for truth to bubble at your mouth firm and taciturn, 4-19-2020, emptying my belly full of sin sunshine, trying to be scrubbed clean. And my last one for you guys, 4-26-2020, 10 days. Lately, I've been cracking memory from bones. Thank you all so very much for listening. Enjoy your weekends. Happy Friday. Your, that was amazing. Thank you so, so much for reading today. That was so, so brilliant and such a, a just an amazing conclusion to this program. Thank you so much from all of us at The Rail for that. Um, thank you all as well, of course, to Renee and to Eleanor for this dialogue today. Thank you, Amy from Guildhall for their support in preparing for today's event, as well as Joe Brando's support. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring our NSC program and making daily conversations like this one possible. They support our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like this one, our daily news social environment. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Jay Clark, David Carrier, Peter Aitchison, and Sarah Jackson on the occasion of Edvard Munch, Trembling Earth at the Clark Institute in Massachusetts. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Alan Fisher. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And I hope you all have lovely and inspiring weekends. You too. Oh, and fun. come to the right. thing. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you. 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 Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.